I'm Mark. He's Brian. This is Mark 2.0. And we brought welcome Robert Boxtel to the Mark 2.0 podcast. Actor Robert Boxtel, author, you name it. Thank you for being here, Robert. So much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to Brian to start this thing out. Sure. Okay. So I heard about uh, the fat man kind of last minute. And I wish I could have rushed over and watched, you know, every little bit of that. I'm kind of a fan of that movie. Um, uh, uh, have you gotten a lot of uh, attention from doing that? That movie with? Um, I, no, not really. Hmm. Uh, I, Would you I call it more of like, like, like kind of like a, an, it, it, more of an independent film? Just because the kind of film it is and stuff, which I love. It was this, great. I was like, yeah. Mark, I'm like, Mark, this is so cool. I love this movie, you know. And um, d- d- can you tell me how, how you got that part and, and the story behind that? How you ended up in that movie? Sure. Um, uh, well, I was uh, sent some slides by my agent. I, I live up in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, capital city of Canada. And we don't, there's not a lot of feature films that happen here. A lot of Christmas movies that are made. Hallmark comes out here and makes sure. Okay. Yeah, they make about 16 movies a year up here, I think. Yeah. Um, I I don't do them, but uh, a lot of people do, and that's great. Good for them. Um, So uh, my agent uh, sends me stuff that I hope is a little more meaningful. Um, And when this script came uh, along, I was very excited by it because uh, I, I heard that it was the Nelms brothers who were doing it and they were favorites of mine. Um, one of my, my favorite movies of all time is Small Town Crime, um, which was, I had seen it, uh, I think on Netflix, I'm not sure, one late night. I was just flicking around and I saw this thing and I went, I'm going to try this movie. And I fell in love with it. I, I have seen it half a dozen times at least mm. since then. And and the maker of that movie is the the person making this movie. It's the same guys. It's two guys. The, the, wow. It's right. Ian, Ian and Asham Nell. Hmm. And they're great guys. I, I, I found out later. Um, so I, I did the audition. Now, it's just, it was a self-tape. And I, I, I really dislike self-tapes because I am from the era of going into a room and audition. Sure. Um, and that has all changed now. And... You know, I, I didn't really like that. I, I thought, well, can I not just, can I not go to Toronto? Or are they not casting out of Toronto? And I was told, no, you have to send in a self tape, period. Uh, so I did. I worked really hard on it. Um, and uh, they cast me on the self tape. Uh, that was it. Nice. I didn't have to do a call back or I didn't have to go to the room. Um, so I was really excited about that. And I, I, I got ready for it. Uh, I trained you know, I took care of myself because I reading the script, it looked like there was going to be a lot of physicality, um, a lot of running around and shooting guns and all of that nonsense, uh, which sounded like a lot of fun to me. Uh, I was really looking forward to it. And it was, it was, it exceeded all of my hopes and dreams. Oh, it it nice. was a fabulous, fabulous experience. Um, Ian and Esham, the, the two brother directors, uh, producers, writers, are, they're just brilliant and wonderful guys, uh, really enthusiastic, so welcoming and positive and supportive. Um, and the entire cast was just phenomenal. They did an amazing job of casting that film. Um, so the feeling on the set was just excellent all the time. Everyone was there to work, uh, but in a really positive way way everybody liked the script everybody liked the kind of quirkiness of the story which definitely you gotta admit it's 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 white it's out there right it's great (laughs) (laughs) really it is very unusual but but you know it's it's different because my kid won't watch it you know he saw it the first time and i'm like let's watch that that was like last year I, i literally haven't watched it this year because he doesn't want to watch it and i understand why i understand why because it's edgy you know but i just thought gosh you know what is gibson doing you know well how how much was he involved in in the creation of this thing yeah as far as i know uh 
they got the script to him when they were at Khan uh, through an intermediary. Uh, and because they'd been working on this for 10 years, they'd been trying wow. to get this project going. They had to do small town crime, I think, to prove. I'm not sure that I, I, you'd have to ask these guys. Uh, they're great guys. If you can get in touch with them, they, they love chatting. They're great. Nice. Um, <laughs> and they're probably promoting something else right now because they're always really busy. Uh, but, uh, you know, they, they got the script to him somehow and uh, he really liked the idea he liked the tone of it and everything and, and they had the conversations and he was on board I, I think that was it the script was finished it was ready to go they had been writing it and rewriting it for a decade so uh, the, every year they would sit down and they would do a polish of it and they kept trying to sell it but every year they sat down and did another polish so it was uh, you know in really good shape it was it was shootable um, and I think M Mel Mel. I call him Mel. Um, he hopped on board and, and was ready to go, man. He was he was there to work. It was fantastic. You nice. can't I met him in public once and he's just Mel. I mean, he really is. He asked if I wanted to go first because I was kind of behind him. He was clearly ahead of me. He's like, if you'd like, you know, he was like that. And I was like, wow. You know, and I, I congratulated him about the gutsy moves he had made in his movies, you know, and I th thought he had, you know, probably a big part in this just because it was a Christmas thing, you know, because Mel is, you know, very Christian and all that. And, you know, I, 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 I kind of admire all of that and stuff, but I didn't realize these two guys were really the backbone of this whole thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they, I mean, it was storyboarded. It was, it was ready to go. And they have these two guys had a vision. And uh, yeah. you know, Mel was on board. He came Perfect in guy. Was on board. Perfect so, guy to do it. Yeah, I thought so. I mean, I, I you know, I really enjoyed uh, working with him because he's just a consummate professional. He was, you know, he was there. He was prepared. He was, he was, he was, uh, you know, on target, uh, supportive, uh, giving, honest. It was just a, you know, great to work with a, with an actor of that caliber. It really was. I, I'd, mm -hmm. I'd admired him from the time I was a young man. I didn't tell him this when I was working with him, but he was the reason that I got into show business 40 years. Wow. See, Jeez. see, I feel the same way about him. You don't walk away from Braveheart the same. And he keeps doing that, you know, with Apocalypto and and then and literally even his role in as Santa. I was like, oh my god, what, what the hell did I just see? <laughs> I mean, I, I can't believe I just yeah. was on that ride and I don't buy movies. And I'm like, I saw that trailer. I'm like, bye. And I watched it. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> what was he thinking? <laughs> They're going to they're gonna come at him again, just to, like Passion of the Christ. And But no, no, it wasn't his movie. It wasn't his movie at all. But he no. was probably just thrilled like that, like a kid when he saw this and said, oh yeah. I want to be Santa. I want to be yeah. the tough Santa that Santa would be today. <laughs> the Santa in a yeah, shoot em up. Why not? You know. Yeah. So, so forgive me for hearing about this so later. I would have watched it. What is your role exactly in the movie, and, and what did you do in the movie? Uh, I was uh, uh, a military guy. The guy cutting deals with Santa. Yeah, because uh, he, he was he'd fallen on the you know the, the workshop had fallen on a little bit of hard times because not enough people really believed in Christmas and you know spoiler his, what did the military workshop. want from Santa though? Well, he, they wanted to use his workshop to uh, build build you know, arts that's uh, right guidance system. See, Mark, this is it's yeah, so it's, funny. Uh, it's just brilliant. It's just brilliant. And this is this is only a small part of the movie too because you know no. there's a whole big thing at the beginning but but please what was your thing exactly in the movie well I, you know i was i was kind of the guy who was in charge of the military operation coming yeah in i remember and, you yeah setting up the warehouse with the yes hotels okay and, and setting up security and all of that kind of stuff right yeah i saw you i'm sorry i'm like he's the head military guy that was talking to him, yeah, making the yeah. deal yeah yeah, yeah. awesome a, awesome awesome there's a there's a guy who is uh, uh walton goggins plays the part brilliantly uh, as he does everything else, uh, Walton is a, a hitman, and he's been hired by this kid who got a lot yeah. of 
he's been uh, hired so to go on and assassinate uh, Chris Kringle. Um, so he goes out there, but he's got to penetrate my security first to get to uh, Santa, right? Um, and that's, mm. you know, I'm, I'm just kind of the first layer that he gets through and then be on there. Uh, so it was great. I got to have a, a really interesting firefight with Walton. Um, in, it was in, the most fun in, thing in that happened. Workshop. It was hilarious. Oh God, mm -hmm. it was beautiful. Yeah. It was so I couldn't, fun. I couldn't a fun, a hilarious was... fun ride. Yeah, yeah. What well, what what was funnest? What was so fun to you? I mean, well, you uh, if know, you can if you can narrow it down. <laughs> it really it, it all was. Uh, mm. it, it was you know the 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 firefight was fun because they said un, unlimited rounds. Just when when you shoot, just shoot. Just start firing and fire and fire. Oh, nice. <laughs> fire. Just keep going, right? Um, so that that was a lot of fun. Um, and it was, you know, of course, it was all very, very, very safely done and everything it was extremely cold. Um, mm. We had a, a very cold shoot. Uh, we were in, a, in the middle of a cold snap. So it was like 35 below zero for a lot of that. Out, wow. outdoor stuff. So it was really cold. That's why all those movies are filmed there. Uh, well, and no wonderland. So it was, uh, you know, I, I had a lot of fun. I think the whole thing was good. It was, it was, uh, they, everyone was treated with a great deal of, of respect and support uh -huh. and kindness and enthusiasm. And they, they, they got performances out of people. Um, they elevated performances out of people by their, by their enthusiasm. Um, so there was, there were, you know, moments where improv was accepted and, and, you know, kind of promoted where they'd say, oh, you know, that little thing you did there, do more of that. Let, let's see. Mm -hmm. let's just go with it. So they know the material so well that they, you know, they figured, OK, we can push this a little or push that a little and uh, and maybe get something a little extra out of that moment. And so that that's always fun for an actor. It really is. So sure. there you go. Uh, great experience all around. Yeah. What, no, uh, I, what, yeah, I wanted Mark, to, yeah. Yeah, what I wanted to ask you is what were some of your most memorable, speaking of, uh, you know, not having to do self tapes, uh, when you did auditions in person, what were some of your most memorable auditions where you just nailed it and got the part? Uh, those, you know, normally those are kind of the least memorable auditions. Because oh, wow. Often okay. you think you kind of blew it or, you know, you, you're kind of wishy washy about it. You walk out and go. I, I don't. I don't know how that went. Uh, and then they call you. Say, oh yeah, that was fine. We, we'd like you for the role. So those those are not particularly memorable. The memorable ones for me are the ones that I either you know I did a really bad job or the ones that I walked out of uh, just kind of went like, Bob, I'm not doing this. Wow. Okay. Mm. So, uh, because I was doing so many of them at one point in my life, uh, upwards of four a day. Uh, sometimes it, I mean it was there was a period in Toronto. Uh, when I was living there and working there in, in, the, in the 90s, where uh, it was extremely busy. Wow. Sure. There, there was just so much going on. And I was of an age um, and of a kind of a profile, I guess, uh, that uh, a lot of parts were written for guys in my kind of genre or whatever. Oh, okay. Um, I so it. I was getting loads of auditions. And I had... I have enough experience behind me um, and I was, you know, getting a little bit known in the industry. So, so the casting agents were calling me in for a, a lot of these parts. So a lot of the times it was just a matter, it was just a matter of getting there on time. Uh, <laughs> sometimes it was, it was really Four hard. Day. Oh, it was really hard to take time to prepare because uh, it wasn't four a day every day, but there were times where you really had to rush from one to another to another uh, and you couldn't really <laughs> It must be very tempting to try to get in the best part, you know, and that means playing the numbers and, you know, you're a young, healthy man. And so you're out there going, no, no, no. Yes. No, no, no. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. It was, it was at times it was a load of fun. Other times it was a real slog because I didn't, uh, there were periods of time where I was kind of living on the road. So I didn't actually have an apartment in Toronto. I had a, a locker on King street where I, I kept my stuff. So I had a clothes rack in there and often between auditions, I would run to my storage locker or take a cab and say, wait here for a second. I'd go in, I used to call it my Superman change room. I'd go in there and I would change for the next audition, like wow. out of a suit and into, you know, a hoodie or something. And then I'd get to my next audition, come back and change for another one. 
uh, rather than drag clothes around with me. Um, That's smart as hell. It really well, is. I'm, in, I'm, I'm learning the tricks you guys did. And I'm like, wow, this... people bring their own cars full of stuff and that's actually smarter. You have like a quick change, like like like, like a closet ready to go. Yeah, like a super no, closet. There's nowhere to park anyway. I mean, you're gonna spend half. Oh your day yeah, park. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, you know, you're gonna be paying for parking. You're gonna be, you know, forget it. Take a, grab a cab, go to the locker, change, go grab a cab to the next, or you know, mm. streetcar or subway, whatever. But anyhow, um, yeah, one of our viewers is gonna steal that idea. I think. Go ahead, yeah. it's yours. Yeah. <laughs> that was a good one. No, I know. How long have been doing well, this now? You know, so okay. Uh, what? How long have I been doing this? Where did you grow up, by the way? In Canada? Uh, yeah. Your parents I, did uh, too. Uh, yeah. I uh, I was born in uh, Saint Boniface, Manitoba, mm -hmm. which is uh, kind of the geographical center of Canada. Um, and where were your parents born? Also uh, Canada. They were born in Saint Boniface. Yeah, mm -hmm. there. Um, and my on my father's side, his his dad was born in belgium mm. so yeah two generation uh but yeah uh I, so i'm a flatlander i'm from the prairies um and eventually i got out of there fairly young we moved overseas we were living in the third world for a few years my dad was working there and when we came back we ultimately ended up in ottawa um, mm. and i've kind of you know been back and forth here most of my life i've lived in toronto for 25 years i lived in northern ontario i lived here there but i have since come back here uh as the, you know parents and in-laws and stuff get older and uh we, you know uh, i have a son uh who has special needs and it's nice for him to be around family and so and they're here in ottawa so and i'm kind of retired anyway it doesn't matter <laughs> Yeah. You know. nice. So when you were doing this at first, did you uh, have your parents' support? They uh, back you up, hundred percent, or they no, no, no. Now, what did they want you to be? A priest. Wow. No kidding. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. A priest, or uh, failing that, uh, uh, some profession that would make enormous sums of money, like mm. a lawyer, really, doctor, yeah. Hmm. But they they were they were never really you know kind of wholeheartedly pushing me towards any of those things. They just wished mm. that, uh, they you know they were very old fashioned uh, and uh, ex extremely religious, mm -hmm. um, and not necessarily in a good way at all, and uh, no nothing positive there, nothing supportive. Uh, so I was on my own. I left pretty early. Um, mm. So yeah, it yeah. seems like you did pretty well. Oh uh, yeah. yeah. I, I think I did okay. I, I mean, there's a couple of things that my father taught me, and one of them was that uh I didn't want to be like him. So that was good, you know. Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. to, to see that role model and go, no, nah, not for me. He always said, you know, you think I like going to work? I hate going to work, but I do this mm -hmm. for you. And I thought, mm -hmm. I don't ever want to be that. I want to love going to work. And yeah. So that, I swore to myself when I was a young man, as soon as I stop looking forward to going into work, I, I'm going to change what it is that I'm doing. And I did that when, when I was 49. Uh, I was uh, living in, in, in the, the near north of Ontario, up near Perry Sound, and I was commuting to Toronto. It was about three, three and a half hours on a good day to really get from my place to downtown toronto and into an and i made that last year i made 57 trips to toronto i don't know how many auditions i did and i didn't score a day's work in that year wow. and i thought okay the tables turned the laws of diminishing returns uh have come into play um and uh i stepped back and i i retired at 49 i went i'm not enjoying this anymore mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and i looked around and i decided that, uh, you know, my, my wife said, well, what was it that you wanted to do when you were younger? You know, was there anything else? And I said, in high school, I had a choice in my mind. I either wanted to be an interior decorator. I don't know where that came from. Because I, I, don't, I, I don't want to be an interior decorator. Uh, uh, and the other thing I, I always wanted to do was I wanted to become a librarian. So I did that. I went back to school. And uh, I ended up running my own small rural library in northern ontario nice 
and those were the kind of the peaceful years. <laughs> <laughs> Fascinating. It was yeah. great. A lot of people in the business asked me because I, you know, I, I have so many friends and colleagues uh, in the business. I've, I've been in the business now forty years. Uh, who said, "Why, well, you know, why are you doing that? Why, you know, why?" You... I said, "Because I think in libraries, for one thing, it's quiet, but for another thing, nobody lies to you. Hmm. Hmm. It's not kind of part of the culture. Uh, lying is 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 very much." Uh, you know, kind of part of the show business culture. There's, mm, there's a, there's a, yeah. there's an awful lot of BS that floats around, and there, you know, people are are you know either, you know, doing things behind your back or they're they're doing things right in front of your face that that, that are that are just not true or disingenuous or whatever. And um, I, I really, really got tired of that, where you know I'd be told. Oh, they've asked for you. It's really important that you come in. They really want to see you. They love your work, all that kind of stuff. And I would, and I would get in there, and 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 these people would have no idea who I was. Mm, sure. Okay. And mm -hmm. well, why? What are you here for? What are you reading for? Uh, and it was like, I, I don't need all that. Uh, you know. Oh, the library was really nice for quite a while, <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's when I kind that's of started point. writing. I started writing. Nice. Books. Yeah, yeah. I've spent yeah. so much time in library. It's such a safe, you know, you know, place of of research and facts. Really, you is. know, you know, no, you know, I, and and the world, the world is a lie. The world, especially now, you know, you can even choose your lie. You turn the channel to a new lie. You know, you can mm -hmm. it's lie after lie. You know, but now I think you know information and lies are getting so big and so overblown that our future kids are going to be able to sift through it in a better and and be able to deal with it better than we are because i'm i'm actually lost in it you know mm -hmm. and uh i think it's a very noble thing to to offer a library you know or offer your services to a library a thing that should be absolutely protected and enshrined oh, forever yeah. every single one should have guards around it you know and like yeah I, I think we should be guarding a lot of things that we aren't guarding including libraries anyway yeah cool hey, thing hey. A, a cool thing what you're doing right there i think it really is yeah and well, i know what i can relate to what you're you're saying i mean i was working as like a fly on the wall in la for like 10 years and they'd book you for something, you know, a work, working uh, background. They'd book you for something. Then they call you late night when you can't get another role and be like, oh, no, we don't need you. You know, and it was nothing that fit your character, like heavy prison, you know, tough prisoner. They'd be like, OK, well, are you able to work right, Ray Donovan for tough prisoner or are you able to do that? Or even times they'd say, email your picture. And then the, then you'd get, get back and they'd say, you're booked. And then they're like three weeks later, they're like, mm -hmm. I never booked you for that. You know, all kinds of nonsense oh, going on. Not all the just, time. Not all the time, of course. But no, but uh, it, enough that uh, you know you, you you do come to realize that it's it's woven into the fabric of the industry. So uh, and 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 people get away with it. Uh, yeah. And and they're used to getting away with it. So they think it's okay to do it. Uh, they don't see anything wrong with it, and they don't see. I, I think a lot of people stop seeing how it impacts others. Mm -hmm. um and and that's and that's just hurtful and you know who, who needs that uh, i'm you with know. you yeah um so yeah i mean I, I i i'd like to share your optimism about you know the future of the you know all of the the untruths that are floating around and the and you know the misdirection that that is seems to be kind of everywhere now um but i i i don't know it's a for me it's a wait and see because I, I do a lot of uh, acting instructing. I, I, I teach uh, younger actors, not young, young, but, you know, young people. Um, there's a couple of acting studios here that uh, hire me out and I work for the union a little bit. The actors union, they'll bring me in to do. Uh, I, I just recently taught a master class. And it's interesting to see uh, how uh, a lot of people have have swallowed some of these lies, some mm -hmm. of these untruths. Uh, things that are floating around that that people think are true, 
they're just yeah. generally accepted as true. And they absolutely are not. So uh, there is just so much of it out there. I find, you know, it is hard to wade through for those young people. How are they going to find out whether it's true or not? I guess by getting out there and doing it themselves, you know, and seeing. Great point. Yeah. What about your book, Willow's Run? Talk about that. Oh, well, yeah. You, you got nice. you got a couple hours? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Uh, yeah. Willow's Run. Yeah. Over my shoulder, you can see uh, from my last speaking tour. I've still got some of these things hanging around. Uh, yeah. Um, about uh, nine and a half years ago, uh, a friend of mine was doing this. What is it called? National November Novel Writing Month or something. Nano Remo. I don't know. It's it's a worldwide phenomenon where people will uh, write a novel in one month, or at least the first draft of something. It's a huge kind of thing that goes on. It's like not a competition, really. That's, but, that's a good idea. Yeah, and everybody encourages each other. And there's websites all over the place and strategies. And it's like if you ever really wanted to write a book, you've got the company of thousands of people around the world who are all doing the same thing at the same time. It's yeah. been going on for quite a while now. And I had a friend who was doing it, and it was the first time I heard about it. And I thought, isn't that a cool idea? I'm not going to do that. Um, but I am going to think about writing a book I because I think that's a cool idea. And uh, I kind of I thought about that for a while. And being a librarian, I got all the books I could in on mm -hmm. about writing books, um, especially Stephen King's book on writing, which is mm -hmm. yeah, I use that as kind of my Bible for writing. And uh, it's a brilliant book. If you haven't read it, it's just really interesting to read. And uh, so I started writing this book. Um, uh, I, I sat down and I decided I was going to write a thousand words a day. And um, I wrote longhand by candlelight uh, with no technology at all and no electricity. I was in a little bunkie that I had built overlooking my lake. I lived, lived in Mirror Lake. And uh, I. I found pens just pens that i found here and there or stole from. And, and i wrote longhand on these little exercise books um no technology zero and uh i finished i think it was about 10 and a half or 11 months later i wrote every day and i had a stack i had a a, a very very big book i had a basically it would have been a thousand page novel my first draft. um and over the years, I have edited, knocked it down. I've written 19 drafts. Um, and I hired editors to come in, give me a hand, and work with me. Um, and a lot of other people who were beta readers, they read it. Uh, friends, family helped me out. Um, and then uh, I formed a company, uh, a publishing company. And, wow. and then this, uh, I got this out in March of last year. This is the large print version. Of it. Damn, that's awesome. It's in that's all... a great technique. Really? Well, yeah, it's I mean, a, it was like, it I'm was... going to write a book and you're not sure what to do. I think what you just said is a good way to do that. I mean, Ooh. at least if you want to take, yeah, you got to find your subject, of course, but then just sail into it like that and just, just create quantity and then find the, the quality within. Within, yeah. Well, I've been mm. writing. I've been writing off and on for years. I've been publishing short stories uh, in literary magazines and stuff. And I, I was in development to write a television series with a with a, a global television network up here for a couple of years. Um, so I was writing, but I had I had no idea um, how to go about writing a novel. Um, so I kind of learned as I went. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it was an enormous amount of work, but it was very satisfying. Um, I've done the audio book as well. It's in all formats worldwide on all platforms. It's selling fairly well. Still trying to get word out, which is tough, you know. Wow. Well, uh, how much you want to spoil it for us? Go ahead and talk talk about it as much as you want, really. The story itself or anything. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I can tell you this. It is a thriller. It's a mystery. Nice. It is a page turner. The reviews mm. online are amazing. Five star reviews everywhere you look. Um, it is a, is a what, what how about it? a brief synopsis? I mean, what's okay. okay. Uh, it's, it's about a, uh, it's about a woman. Um, it's, she's the main character 
she is a, uh, a, a kind of a disgraced uh, ex Olympic volleyball player mm, who wow. let down on the U S uh, they felt she let her down in the, in, in the final gold uh, game at, uh, uh, at the Olympics. And mm. uh, she, she injured herself really badly and had to be wow. carried on court. She got addicted to drugs. She fell in with a bad crowd. And the beginning of the book is her having escaped from this vicious man that she married mm. and she's trying to get clean and uh, she steals his $2 million RV and makes an escape across the U S she ends up in this, she ends up rolling the thing over in this small forgotten town uh, in Northern New York state. Um, and that's where the action starts. Uh, this guy is coming after her. She meets some people mm. in the town and she starts uncovering. She learns things about this town that uh, it's very, very dark. Um, often funny. She meets up, you know, with the, with the, uh, the people of the, of the town. Um, she in, ends up having a relationship with this one man and uh, they were all very generous and they try to hide her from this person, but she starts to discover the dark underbelly of this place. Um, so it gets to the point where it, you, you can't, you physically have to turn the next page mm -hmm. because there's so much going on. It's a, if I've, I wanted to write something that was propulsive, I needed something. I needed uh, to put something out there that people would want to. Uh, they needed to know what happens next, right? Oh, I need closure already. This is going to be a movie someday. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how, how, long this, how long has this book been in existence now? Uh, since March of last year. So not even. That's it. Oh, not even a year. The Ooh, the, the that's rights even are, more tantalizing. Uh, they're up for sale. Uh, I haven't pitched it to Netflix yet because I haven't, I haven't, I'm not going to be writing the scripts for it. Uh, I'm, I'm done writing scripts, uh, but I have sent it to some people. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll see. I mean, uh, you know, all I can do is just keep getting the word out there and getting people to read the book. The more people read the book, the more likely it's going to find its way into hands of people who might mm. say, you know, this is a six part series because it it is really it's mm. very cinematic. Yeah, I would go straight to Amazon oh, if I were yeah. you. We're keeping an eye on this one, aren't we, Mark? Oh, yeah. Mr. Box doll, the only uh, track of this. This is going to be good. <laughs> really good. Yeah, it's going to be good. I can see this coming right now. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you were regular on the TV show North of 60, were you not? I was. I was. I was one of the Jeez. leads on North of 60. It was a oh, was that great like? job. We were we filmed that out in uh, in the Kananaskis Mountains in um, outside of Calgary in Alberta. Beautiful, beautiful country. Damn it, I gotta get to Canada, Mark. All these people. It's great. Yeah. <sighs> well, I love is, snowy I mean, stuff. It is one of the biggest countries in the world. We've got kind of everything here. Uh, we've got everything. There's a desert in Canada in in Manitoba. There is a wow, desert. Okay. There, there are there are mountains. There are tundra there's forests there's more lakes here than you can count i mean the province of manitoba alone has over a hundred thousand lakes and that's one of you know 10 provinces so wow we we do have you know an enormous amounts of fresh water forest blah, 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 blah. Uh, it's a remarkable place i've done a lot of traveling through canada i took one little trip uh with my wife Catherine, uh years ago we started from ottawa where i am now in, in my jeep we were camping and we took a 14,000 kilometer drive. We only did half the country. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it really is yeah, sweet. Big. Oh, yeah. Massive, massive I, place. I, I could not get enough of that. I would just keep going and going and going. I've, mm. I've been to uh, Banff, uh, Calgary, Toronto. And it's funny, when I was in junior high, we went over. To, do you know Point Pilu? Like on the other side of Michigan? Because I grew up in Michigan. It's where yes. the butterflies migrate, that, yes. that area. Yeah, we went over there, me and my classmate, to do the assignment for science class. We come back, you know, and, and we did a badass job. Not only did we go to Canada for this science project, he comes back and Mr. Bergman gives us a C. We're like, we we came out of the country to do this project and you give us a C, dude? Like, what's up with that? 
<laughs> you got to go to the moon for an A or something. Well, <laughs> when I was young and I finally got the internet, I remember talking to people from Canada and they were just so nice. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And that was, that blew my mind, you know, because I was talking to people in other countries, but the Canadian people were like, Oh my gosh, they're just incredibly nice and kind and friendly. And excuse me, the more people I meet, I mean, I heard Canada's nice. I have nothing to miss. I've never been to Canada. I know what trees, very, very tall trees and snow is. It ain't that. It's really the atmosphere and the people that really are intriguing to me and the speakers that I listen to. I just like the Canadian people I've met. And um, I just I just feel I need to go there because I just it just seems like a great just just a great time to well it, it is a wonderful country and it is they're wonderful people and they're kind of like from from manitoba i, I can't say uh who who's the nicest but there there are you know gradations of of nice niceness uh you mm-hmm. know it, in the east you 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 get the nova scotians and the newfoundlanders and and everyone says that they're they're the best and they are my awesome. french is not good you don't need you know, French up there. You know, I can say like omelette du fromage. I'll get breakfast. That's it, though. <laughs> that's go. all I'm going to get. You don't yeah. need French. You can get by with English. No problem. Mm, cool. uh, some parts of northern Quebec, yeah, you might, you know, you might get a few <laughs> stairs. But well, otherwise. I can have breakfast for dinner. That's okay. Yeah. No, it's mm. great. It's uh, I think generally a lot of Canadians are very happy because they're, you know, we're, we're quite healthy. We have universal health care here. So mm, yeah, you know, we all we all have good teeth, and you know we're kind of taken care of <laughs> you know, physically it's too. True. But you're pretty happy, you know. And there's a great, there's a really tremendous education system here, uh, which is also you know kind of top notch. So what, uh, what uh, were your so, thoughts on the city? Because I in 2020, in February 2020, in the dead of cold, I went to Toronto and stayed at the Ice Condos on 14 York, right across from the uh, arena. And okay, I, I you know. Uh, I don't know. The are the smaller areas more preferable to you or uh the cities? You know, I, I I've never been a fan of of big cities. I've never been a fan of of Canadian North American cities. I've you know, I've been to a lot of North American cities and I'm I'm not a fan of them. There are some European cities that I continue to go back to sure. um because they they at least have a history that's more than, you know, one or two hundred years old. Uh, I, I do like older architecture and, and history. Um, so there's, there's that, but no, I, I do prefer kind of a mid-sized place mm. or a smaller place. That's why Ottawa kind of suits me perfectly. It's, I see it's what you're saying. Small, yeah. It's well tended. It's safe. It's, 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 it's a beautiful, it's a world-class capital city. I mean, if you just take a look at some pictures on the internet, it's extraordinarily beautiful. Yeah. Um, and there's, you know, so there's federal money that goes in here. So, you know, it's it's really pretty. It seemed like in Toronto, and I, I really like Toronto, but it, people were just like scrambling to get around, and they have to, you know, work all the time just to, you know, survive and everything. Yeah, that's you know, I find that in a lot of cities. <laughs> that's a good know. point, especially yeah. nowadays. Yeah, and and it's it's got to be really bad when it's super cold and you're homeless. You know, it's really oh, hard. Yeah, okay, it's awful, awful place to be. Um. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, this, some cities like that, I find they don't have enough soul. They don't have enough, you know, social responsibility to go out and take care of their own. I, that really, I don't know. If, anyway. No, I agree. I agree. I agree 100%. I saw that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So anyhow, uh, no, Toronto, you know, it, it, to me, it was it was a, a decent enough place to work from for a number of years. Right. Uh, I lived in a, in a kind of a nice pocket uh quieter just outside of the city center so it wasn't you know kind of noisy and crazy all the time uh so it wasn't that bad but whenever i could i i lived like outside way outside the city uh i would just go in to the work sure uh, that that's always been preferable for me yeah. yeah were you a fan of uh talking about history castle loma or were you like eh? <laughs> Because I did go and see it, you know what I mean? Because everyone's like, "Oh, you got to see Castle Loma," you know. Sure. What's that? Sure. Uh, tell them. Tell them what it. Tell them what it is. What it's, is it's that? Just, it's this. It's this kind of fake castle that some rich guy built up on a hill, uh, to, so that he could kind of lord over the city. Um, Big money. 
yeah, big, big money. He said he built it for his wife. I don't know if that's true or not, but I think like either she died or he died before it was finished. Uh, really, it's it's a kind of a, a an architectural anomaly. It's it's okay, kind of neat to walk through and stuff, and it's perched up on this hill, so it's quite visible, and it's become a tourist destination. So mm -hmm. you know, Toronto has that going for it. But uh, no, I've, I've I've only ever shot there. I've never kind of gone there on my own. Oh, okay. I've yeah. gone there to, to shoot. What was I shoot? I, I shot uh, Relic Hunter with Tia Carrera. Mm. Okay. In and around there. And, uh, you know, so I have fond memories of it for that reason alone. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's great. Yeah. That's great. So what are your goals now? Goals. Well, I'm writing another, I've written another book and I'm in the third mm. draft of it right now. So this year I'm going to be spending on that. Um, uh, I want to start traveling again because my wife and my son and I do a great deal of traveling, but that's been kind of curtailed uh, the last few years. Um, and uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, and, you know, we've also got elderly, you know, family, so we don't want to be, you know, killing them with our breath. Uh yeah. So we've kind of been we've been taking it easy, you know, isolated, sure. doing all those things, <laughs> uh, and it's worked out well because I haven't been sick a day in like three and a half years. Nice. Uh, so goals, yes, you know, just stay healthy and uh, stay creative. Um, I've kind of stepped back quite a bit from uh, auditioning. I'm, I'm not really doing it anymore. Um, you know, I worked a lot for a long time sure and, yeah uh you know i'm, I'm very happy mm -hmm. with with you know what i did like my body of work but I, I was never kind of i was never the guy who wanted that much more I, mm -hmm. I wanted to work um i wanted to enjoy kind of my craft i did a lot of theater as well i did 16 years of live theater and wow I, okay also, you know i direct give us a highlight or two on that a uh, highlight or two on that period while, uh, you know, living out of a suitcase for six years and working Hell yeah, man. all of the major nice. uh, regional theaters across the country, you know, cool. uh, playing for 900,000 people a night, uh, doing, you know, Shakespeare's Macbeth, doing mm -hmm. all kinds of amazing, wonderful plays. Uh, See, working. no wonder you don't like the BS of it. You like that thrill of it. Well, it's the know? real work, you know, it's the real work. Oh, yeah. That other stuff, you know, I love, I don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I, I've been a leader or a regular on seven different television series and like a hundred movies. I like being on set. Don't get me wrong. It's all the other stuff that I like. Yeah, I, know, I feel yeah, Yeah. Right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Well said. I, I, well I said. Love Enough movies. said. <laughs> did you, now, did you prefer <laughs> movies over TV or it didn't matter to you? Uh, you know, I kind of, I, I have to say, uh, for the most part, I prefer television mm -hmm. because of, uh, and I don't, I, I never really like that much being a guest star because they okay. kind of parachute you in. You're, you're, you're dropped in, you're given all this expository material while the leads are standing around listening to you and you're doing a lot of, all the complicated lines. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and which is fine. It gives them a break, but it doesn't give you a break. And you don't know necessarily how the crew is working and how other people are working together. You're just popped in for a few days and then they, you're, you're, you're knocked out again. So I didn't like guest starring, but I did like uh, being a regular character on a series because it gave you this kind of continuity and this, this, this ability to develop a character over a longer period of time and experience you know, these different things that might affect the character's development. And 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 really, you know, when people talk about a family on a on a television series, you know, it, it's very can very much be the case mm -hmm. um, where there's a there's a closeness that's developed between the kind of core ensemble group, um, and it's, it's really lovely. It's it's uh, very supportive and and you yeah. know creative. So I yeah, I prefer television for that. Yeah. Uh, the film, you know, sometimes it's great when you get a film or, you know, you want to talk about Fat Man. Uh, it's great because, you know, it, it's, it's also feature film money. So the, the money is, nice. you know, you're you're compensated for your time quite, you know, generously. And that's always nice. 
Were you booked as a regular on when you were on the uh, famous Jet Jackson? Because like I told you, I watched every single episode of that. I actually met Lee, you know, before he passed. He seemed like yeah. a great guy. You know, Lee was a Lee was a, a lovely young man. Um, it, that, this was a long time ago, Jet Jackson, right? Yeah, it was a long it time was. ago. It, it yeah. was still a cult following, though. Uh, no doubt, no doubt. I, I did a couple of seasons of that uh, as, as as Mr. Dupree, the the yeah. school team. And uh, I have incredibly fond memories of working on that series. Um, it was a, uh, it was it was very kind of closely guarded mm -hmm. because it was Disney. Uh, you know, they were very careful about things. Oh yeah, I've worked at Disney Studios in Burbank. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. For for a whole number of reasons, partly because it was a young cast, partly because. Uh, this was the first kind of all black uh, cast that they'd had. There were just a couple of white people in it um, for the for a TV series. This was groundbreaking for Disney, um, as far as I remember. Um, and they were bringing in a lot of guest stars uh, that mm. were, you know, pretty important people. Um, I mean, I you know, I got to work with Beyonce, which was, you know, wow. well... I, I didn't think so at the time because I had no, no idea. I, exactly. I know what you mean. She was just a young woman uh, who, who was, you know, they had this band called Destiny Child. And I had no <laughs> idea who Destiny Child was. I was a 40 year old man. What the hell was <laughs> sure. to that stuff? Makes total they sense. They said, oh, Destiny's Child's here. And I'm like, like who? who? I, okay. Um, <laughs> but anyway, we, you know, we worked together and she was lovely and we're hardworking and, and, and all of that stuff and, and and it was really enjoyable and it's only years later that i went oh yeah okay i, I know who she is she did really really well yeah and i can see years half time at the super bowl there she is there you go yeah, yeah. yeah. good point yeah yeah uh, that series was really great and lee was a very a very nice young man and i do remember him being a somewhat melancholy young man mm -hmm. we we uh several times sat apart from the rest of the cast while they were setting up a shot or yeah. you know after lunch or something and he came over and he would ask me uh questions about life beyond uh you know your young years wow what happened when you're you know if, if i'm still doing this when i'm in my 30s what can i expect you know stuff like that and we had mm. these kind of interesting conversations about you know, being financially and fiscally responsible. Um, and he really, he really affected me uh, deeply when he said that uh, all the money that he initially made, uh, he, he bought a house for his mom. And that, that makes I, total sense because when I met him, I met him. I, I also worked on Rizzoli and Isles, the episode that he worked on, but I met him because I was working at a CBS pharmacy in Studio City in the valley and he was picking up a prescription for his grandma and i'm like i i, I know who you are i'm a big fan of yours thank you so, you know just down to earth guy going to pick up was, his grandma's prescription i mean yeah you yeah. wouldn't get that from most actors no and he, he was you know he was a real he, he appreciated everything that they had done for him and uh, they meant a lot to him uh, it seemed like the know. whole cast too really yeah yeah <laughs> it was mm -hmm. pretty funny um yeah it was it was it was an interesting time for me so it was uh, it was great for for me to be grounded in that i was doing a, another series at the same time um and that was like uh, i think it was the third or fourth in a row that i was doing one series and during that series i landed another series so i was doing both at the same time mm, nice. the first nice. one ended and i i I leapfrogged to another one. So I was doing two series at the same time. And then I leapfrogged to another. So I was kind of going between sets an awful lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jet Jackson was one of those times I was, I was shooting something else at the same time. And it was always kind of the set that I, when I arrived, I could take a deep breath um, and, and really enjoy myself there. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Robert, what if Disney said, we're taking P Willow's run, we're going to run with that. So who who do you see as the girl in uh, Willow's run, and who do you see as the uh, crazy husband? <laughs> <laughs> what well, are your acting actor choices? Uh, you know, I, I would have the same same issues, I think, that, uh, that Lee Child had when they were casting Jack Reacher. 
Mm. Um, because uh, because Willow, the main character, Elsima Willoughby, is six foot six. Uh, and I, I don't know how many actors you're going to find that are six foot six. And the, the thing is uh, about this character is that um, because of all the situations and whatnot, it, she has to be that big. You, you couldn't mm. you couldn't hire Tom Cruise to play her. Mm. Right. Like, like he tried to do with Jack Reacher. It, it just didn't work. Maybe Michelle Obama wanted to start acting. Uh, no, nah, she would have to be, uh, you know, six foot. I six. think she's taller than her service Secret Service agent. She's really I tall. Think, I think she's like <laughs> five ten or five eleven. Oh, is she? <laughs> okay. She needs another. She needs another half a foot, maybe. <laughs> go. But uh, either way, the uh, WNBA is your place to go, definitely. I know that I can write it for me. That's all. Yeah. Uh, I, I, there's no part in it for me. Maybe you know, maybe as a as a background performer walking back in the cafe or having a hamburger. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I hope something cool happens with that. I'm definitely going to check that story out. Definitely. Thank and you. thanks so much sure. for what you did with the fat man. I had a great ride on that movie. It was so fun. Oh man, you did a great awesome. job. You did a great awesome. job. I loved it. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, any yeah. more questions, Mark? No, I hate this was such an honor. And, you know, I'm going to make sure to check out every single one of your films. I mean, we really appreciate you. Well, I'm definitely going to keep an eye on you. And please come back if anything happens, you want to promote anything, sure. anything you want to come back just to chat, man. You just hit us up and we'll have another show. Thank you. Well, that's, that's yeah. very kind of you both. I appreciate it. I appreciate your time. That's uh, right, yeah. a great time. We really love, love what you're doing. This is great. If you enjoyed this podcast episode, click on this playlist to watch even more. And as always, thank you so much for watching.